talk to me. Information, news, and entertainment on demand. Welcome to the Mary Goulet Show, cultivating a rich interior. Now, here's Mary. Welcome to the program. Yes, I'm your host, Mary Goulet. And if you've been following me for a while, you know I've been on the air since 2002. And it all started because I was a mom of two little kids and I wanted to stay home and be an entrepreneur and make a couple bucks so I could be there all the time with my children. Uh, was that smart? Yes, of course it was. But <laughs> anyway, I got out of the studio once a, or out of my house to go to the studio once a week. And that grew. So I love having other entrepreneurs on my show because I think in this climate, everybody's looking for the side hustle. So today, my wonderful guest, I'm very excited, is Tom Singer. And you know, Tom is bigger than life. Tom is a speaker, I think primarily in associations, a national speaker. And he's also a certified speaking professional, which is a very prestigious award to receive. Uh, short for, no, CSP. Um, it's really hard to get. And he is one of the top people. So congrats on that. And he's also, he's kind of, I'll call it his side hustle, He does a podcast called Cool Things Entrepreneurs Do, and he interviewed over 300 CEOs, entrepreneurs, business leaders, solopreneurs, and others to find out what they do and what they can teach others to do to achieve their best and reach the top levels of success. So today, hopefully, we get a few gems out of him. Welcome, Tom, to the show. Hey, Mary. Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm so excited. So let's dive right in. I need to let people know even bigger stuff about you. Um, Have you always been an entrepreneur before you became a professional speaker? No, you know, I wish I had been. I think I always had sort of that desire to go do my own thing sort of burning inside of me. But I did what a lot of people my age did. And I I listened to what my parents said to do. And I, I put my ladder against a corporate wall and spent 20 plus years, you know, bouncing around doing different things in sales and marketing but always felt that that wasn't it. So I, I think I was always scratching you know, my head trying to figure out how to become an entrepreneur. But uh, nine and a half years ago, I started working for myself. And while it hasn't been easy, per se, uh, I've never looked back. Yeah, and I think today with the Internet, it's easier for people to do it. But let's go back to that concept of we're older people, maybe 45 plus They've done that route, um, but their mindset, they, they have that desire, like you were saying, this isn't it, but their mindset maybe has not caught up with the technology that could take them places. Yeah, I think mindset is a big part of it. I also think fear is, is rampant. I mean, people think, oh, if I, if I walk away from this job, I'll lose my house. And those two things, you know, maybe that's tied to mindset, but those two things don't necessarily go together. But you know, I was it. I had decided once I started speaking and I was good at it and people were like paying me, I still had a full-time job. And I told my wife, I want to go out and try this full-time, but but she was a full-time mom. And so we kind of came to a deal that if I could save up X amount of dollars, I think we had decided $100,000 would be my my seed money. And then I could take a couple of years and I'd have a runway to be able to do it. Uh, And then on April 1st, 2009, I got laid off and I had about $20,000 saved. So I was a few years away from being able to jump and there were no jobs in 2009. It was the bottom of the recession. Oh, my gosh. But yeah. you were pushed off the cliff. And, and, I mean, they say April 2009 was the bottom of the recession. So I was pushed out at the absolute worst time. So what would you do? I, you know, I, like I said, I had written a couple books. I was already speaking and doing some side trainings and stuff. And I just jumped in. I just told everybody, this is what I'm doing now. And uh, the good news for me was my prices were lower than the average speaker who was sort of established. And associations were still having their annual meetings, but they didn't know how many people were going to come because so many people were being laid off. Companies weren't investing in training. So they weren't booking speakers until the last minute. And then when they were booking, they only had maybe $2,500 or $3,000 because they were unsure how many people were going to attend. 
where they had been hiring speakers who were five, seven, or ten thousand dollars, my answer was, "I'll do it for a dollar ninety-five and a chicken dinner." <laughs> And, and I was able to jump in, and my topic fit in so well to what was going on in the economy. I was talking about, you know, this is 2009. We had just been introduced to the smartphone, and everybody thought that that was going to solve all their business and sales and marketing problems. And I had sort of a contrarian view. I, I called my talk Connecting with People in a Gadget Crazy World. And I was really talking about getting back to basics. Why do human beings matter? Why does your networking matter? And all the social media folks were laughing at me, saying, no, we're going to tweet our way to success. Introverts never have to leave their house again because of LinkedIn. And I was saying, these are great tools. I love all the social media. I love all the digital. But we still have to invest in people. And the message really resonated. And at conferences, it, it, it took off. And during the next three or four years, I was able to slowly build up you know, some momentum with my, with my speaking business. Well, you know, the stars aligned for you because that's not a typical story. Because when in 2009 you were already doing a little bit of speaking and then you and your wife had this agreement and then your ladder that you had against the corporate wall, somebody kicked it and pushed it off and you <laughs> fell on your face. But you did have something to run with. But when you look back, it kind of played out perfectly for you. Well, perfectly would mean that we didn't struggle. We hemorrhaged cash for a couple of years. It did take about $100,000 to start the business, but I only had twenty. So we ran the rest up on credit cards and, and, and loans sure. from family. And eventually I started earning kind of around what I earned as a corporate marketing director. And all of a sudden we were able to pay that debt down. It took another three years to pay the debt off. But uh, So it's only been the last couple of years that I've actually had you know, Surplus. a little bit of, of, of little breathing room. Yeah. But, yeah. God bless your wife for trusting you because that can be very straining on a relationship. Yeah, it wasn't always it wasn't always easy. There were a couple times she said, "When do you think you have to go get a job? How yeah. long how long sure. do we ride this?" Uh, but so far, every time we've had those ups and downs, the ups always come back and and I love what I do and and audiences tend to like it. A lot more companies are bringing me in to talk at team meetings. I now have a a program called The Paradox of Potential, where I'm talking about how do you get everyone focused on their own potential, not trying to have a one-size-fits-all training for, for a company. And uh, the sales managers and the directors like it, and the people in the audience like it. So now I'm doing more in-company stuff, uh, as opposed to where I used to do all association work. Well, you are a terrific speaker. You're a big personality. <laughs> um, you're a warm person, and you're genuine. So when you go in and speak on the potential, paradox of potential, that could be a little threatening in a way because what if each person's potential <clears throat> is focused on and they start acting on their potential, the higher-ups are not worried that they might see themselves being taken out of the company because they're like, oh, wow, I could do this or I could do that. Well, surveys have actually shown, you know, that companies have been doing these sort of high potential programs for decades, like three decades. Big companies have been identifying, usually young professionals, but not always. They've been identifying employees who they call them hypos for high potential. And uh, Harvard or somebody went and did a study a couple of years ago, and, and it turns out that the people who went through these programs 30 years ago are not necessarily populating the top jobs in the company today. And one of the reasons was when you go and tell people, my God, you're special, you have potential, some of them believe you, and they look around and think, why am I working here? And they leave. So companies have been training people up to leave forever. But most of the companies that I work with, and there are some people, like especially like I, I always have taught one of the, the three buckets of achieving potential is people. And I've always taught this idea of your network and your brand and how do you really connect with others. I've had companies not want me to come in and talk because they say, I've, I've seen it before, if my people are well-networked in the industry – they get hired away for more money. And my argument is, so you want to keep them less trained and less connected and more mediocre, and you want them to stay. So that's what the, the difference is. The companies who hire me realize people aren't going to stay here forever. The average person stays two, three, four years. I want them to do the best they can when they're here. When they move on, I want them to know I gave them everything. Those are the type of companies that hire me. Yeah, and that's awesome that you actually said that out loud. <laughs> did you ask yourself, did I really say that out loud? Because what happens is the person that left, they'll turn to some other person and say, that's a great place to work. Yep. Well, there's a lot of, there's a lot of bosses out there who get that, and there's a lot of bosses out there who don't. 
I tend to get hired by the bosses who are like, look, let's, let the rising tide high, raises all ships. And so that's a synergy. Fortunately, I mean, how many millions of companies are there? I can only do 50 or 60 talks a year. I don't need to worry about the people who want to keep mediocre employees and hide them from the rest of the world. I want to find the ones who want their best and their brightest to get better. And they're not scared of them leaving because they're offering them a great opportunity. And if they leave, they want to support them to fulfill their dreams. And there's enough companies that I could work out the next 15 years just working with them. Wow, that's terrific. So what inspired you to start Cool Things Entrepreneurs Do, the podcast? So I was, uh, gosh, this four years ago, and I was actually at the National Speakers Association. And Great I was place. Listen, I was listening to a, uh, a breakout session, and the person was talking about if you're ever in a rut in your career, and this, he was talking to speakers, but this is true for anybody. If you're in a rut in your career, just go and interview 50 successful people. Because if you were to sit down, and at this time blogs were still a big deal, this before podcasts had exploded, I was a blogger four or five days a week, and I thought, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go interview. I'm going to write 50 articles about successful people in a variety of industries. Because he said that if you interview 50 people at the end of that adventure, which he said would take six months or a year, depending on how many people you could talk to in a week, he said at the end, you can't be in a rut anymore because success leaves clues. Get around successful people. Ask them a lot of questions. You can do it under the umbrella of, oh, I'm writing an article for my blog or whatever. And I bought into that. And that's how I started the podcast. Instead of written, I made it a podcast. Okay, Tom, we're coming up on a commercial break, but I really want to dive into that because that was a terrific tease heading into the next segment. All right, you're listening to The Mary Goulet Show. I'm with Tom Singer. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Thank you. By listening, you help prove that content marketing works. You need to engage your customers. We provide the solution. Contact Wade at WSRadio.com or call 866-WS-RADIO. If you heard that sound, you probably are eligible for insurance from Navy Mutual, insuring the men and women of the Navy, Marines, and Coast Guard. Here's what one policyholder, retired Navy Commander Thomas Dade, had to say. Navy Mutual is the best insurance decision I ever made. I wish you had a savings plan available that earned the rates my Navy Mutual insurance has been earning. Navy Mutual Aid Association, started by military members in 1879, serves active, reserve, and retired military today. Navy Mutual honors our military by providing them affordable life insurance with the features they need without fine print, sales fees, or military service restrictions. Value, integrity, trust, and stability are the cornerstones on which our commitment to you and your loved ones are built. Call Navy Mutual at 1-800-628-6011 or NavyMutual.org for your personal life insurance plan consultation. 1-800-628-6011 or NavyMutual.org. Navy Mutual, insuring those who serve. Which sandwich is healthy and tasty? Which sandwich can come on bread or in a bowl? Which sandwich comes 51 different ways so it's always your way? A which which sandwich? Stop into our shop in Hazard Center. We're upstairs from the Hazard Center Digiplex. Bring in your movie ticket. We will add a free drink and chips to your sandwich order. Or order online at whichwhich.com and we will have it ready and waiting. W-H-I-C-H-W-I-C-H. Whichwhich.com. Hi, this is Rob Barnett, VinVillage.com, where wine lovers connect. Be sure to tune in weekly to Vin Village Radio for exclusive, in-depth interviews with the who's who in wine and food. I can't speak more highly about Progressive Medical Center and how they've helped me get my health back, get my energy back. And Dr. Goley, when I first came to you guys, you found a thyroid problem, and I had no clue. But that's really common with a lot of your patients, right? Underactive thyroid is the most misdiagnosed condition in the United States. According to the American Whoa. Academy of Endocrinology, well over 25% of the population is not being diagnosed properly. It's because of the testing parameters. If you go to your traditional doctor, they could be missing a key component. If you have crushing fatigue, inappropriate weight gain, cold hands, cold feet, losing hair, lack of concentration, even headaches and migraines could be caused by underactive thyroid. At Progressive Medical, we get to the root cause of the problem because we are integrative, and integrative medicine is good medicine. We use a combination of medication, natural supplements, diet, nutrition, lifestyle modification, and that's what makes it so unique because we tailor it to your personal needs, and that's interesting because you are tailored. Yes, and if you want to get your energy back, be the most vibrant version of yourself, you got to get to Progressive Medical Center. I'm so glad I went. Contact them today through ProgressiveMedicalCenter.com. 